Aloha and welcome. I'm Mark Rechtenwald, the Chief Justice of the Hawaii Supreme Court. I'm joined today by Judge Daniel Foley, retired judge of the Intermediate Court of Appeals, and Avi Soifer, who recently retired as the Dean of the William S. Richardson School of Law at the University of Hawaii. Both Judge Foley and Dean Soifer are experts in constitutional law, and our topic today is the state of the Constitution. So we'll be looking at issues ranging from the history of our federal constitution, how it's been amended over the years, how it's interpreted, and how it affects us in our everyday lives. But I wanna begin by focusing also on our Hawaii state constitution. And I'm gonna ask, uh, beginning with Dean Seufer, Dean Seufer, could you explain uh, how it is that we have two constitutions uh, governing us here in Hawaii, just as we do across the nation, and how that works in practice? Well, it works with a lot of arguments back and forth, uh, but it has worked uh, in some ways, I think, in a very effective way uh, to say that whoever wins in one place isn't the winner for all times, because there's this whole other system. Uh, so there are state constitutions throughout the country, as well as the one federal constitution. And it's quite clear that state judges, including our state Supreme Court, uh, can decide things based on their own state constitution. They can't do it in any way to contradict the federal constitution. They can't say, you've decided that and we decide the other way. But they can expand on rights, for example. So as the US Supreme Court interprets, let's say, the right of privacy uh, and says it's limited to X, Y, or Z, uh, the Hawaii State Supreme Court can say, well, our view of privacy is X, Y, and Z, but also A and B. And as long as there's an independent and adequate state ground is the term of art, uh, then the state constitutional interpretation is pretty, not, pretty much insulated from federal court review. So we have a complicated system of federalism, and it really is an ongoing argument. It's been an intense argument at times. Uh, the Civil War was in part in large part about that, as well as about slavery. Uh, and the argument is never really settled. It goes back and forth. Well, uh, Judge Foley, tell, uh, take us back to the uh, 1990s when you were uh, litigating a case called Bear versus Lewin. What were some of the choices faced there as to whether that litigation, tell us a little bit about it and why, what the choices were between going into state or federal court? Well, that really builds on an uh, obvious point is that historically, our state Supreme Court has construed our state Bill of Rights uh, more broadly. We have greater civil liberties under our state constitutional Bill of Rights than under the federal. And um, in 1991, when I filed uh, my case for same-sex marriage, the U.S. Supreme Court had ruled in 1986 um, that sodomy statutes criminalizing homosexual behavior were, was constitutional. And there was not one favorable case out of that court. So the last place you wanted to be in federal court, whether federal district court or the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, because they have to follow the highest court. So it was clear uh, when couples came to me seeking marriage licenses, you didn't want to be in federal court. You didn't want to have Supreme Court review. So the case was fashioned solely under our state constitution and filed in state court to have your court. Uh, the Hawaii Supreme Court have the final word, which could not be appealed um, to the U.S. Supreme Court or to any federal court. And then before the circuit court and the Hawaii Supreme Court, we argued that our right to privacy, our right to equal protection of the law, our right to due process of law were broader for LGBTQ people uh, than the federal courts had acknowledged. So that's how that began. Uh, we had a case under the state constitution. We would not have had a case. But that changed over the years, where federal law changed and federal courts changed. But in 1991, there was a clear choice, state law, state courts only. Dean Swafer, what are some of the other uh, protections that the state constitution provides that aren't addressed uh, explicitly uh, in, our, in, in the federal constitution? Do the language of the two constitutions have to track each other? Can they... Uh, or can they, can they be different, and can there be provisions that uh, address issues that Hawaii might find important, but Delaware might not? Right. So uh, there is, in fact, a reference to privacy in our Constitution and not in the federal Constitution. Now, the federal courts have interpreted privacy. They haven't said it's left out, even though the text is not there. Uh, 
Uh, but our courts can take that language and say, well, it's different here. Uh, so there are a number of areas, particularly in the criminal procedure realm, where actually even the same language can mean different things. Search and seizure, certain things may be permitted uh, in the federal courts that would not be permitted by some of the state courts. And there are many other examples. A, a very important one is whether there's a right to some fundamental right to education. And the U.S. Supreme Court hasn't absolutely said there's no such right, but they certainly have not been enthusiastic over many decades. And a lot of state courts have said, well, our state constitution talks about education, and we think that's important, and here's what we are going to require for funding and so on. So that's an important area where the state courts have gone much further than the federal courts. And I would like to add just one more right, in addition to the right to privacy, uh, which is not expressly in the federal constitution. Um, no gender discrimination, no discrimination based on sex. That was part of our 1950 constitutional bill of rights. And we were a pioneer. We adopted it again as part of the Equal Rights Amendment in 1972. So we have two provisions in our bill of rights that prohibits gender discrimination. And it's treated as race discrimination. You, you, you can't justify it unless you can demonstrate a compelling state interest. Whereas the federal courts have found no gender discrimination under the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause, but it's not given the same weight. Uh, it's easier to discriminate on gender under the federal constitution than it is under our state constitution. And that was something recognized in the same-sex marriage case. To add to Dan's point, uh, for all the remarkable accomplishments of Justice Ginsburg, uh, she hasn't convinced the court to go as far as our court has gone, as our language states. So she certainly deserves the tribute she's gotten, but our federal courts have been more reluctant. Well, with that as a backdrop, uh, let, let's turn to the federal constitution and 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 really go back a little bit to the uh, to the uh, uh, beginnings of that document back in the summer of 1787 in Philadelphia, and the document that emerged is really quite different from the federal constitution that we have today. Um, there's no bill of rights, at least initially. Uh, the document effectively legitimized slavery, uh, denied women the, the right to vote. And in fact, uh, if you, uh, Justice Thurgood Marshall spoke here uh, in, in Hawaii on Maui in 1787, the 200th anniversary of the drafting of the constitution. And this is what he said, the government that the founders devised was defective from the start, requiring several amendments, a civil war, a momentous social transformation to attain the system of constitutional government and its respect for individual freedoms and human rights that we hold fundamental today. So I'd like to take start with the original document and then move through the adoption of the Bill of Rights and then the Civil War and bring us up closer to where we are today. Uh, Dean Stoifer, what do you see as the, the sort of the strengths of the original document in terms of uh, some of the key provisions in, uh, that affect our structure of our government um, that, that really have endured over this period of time. Well, much of what I'm going to say, and I hope we'll say briefly, is sort of paradoxical. Uh, because, for example, we learn, to the extent we learn civics at all, that separation of powers is a very important concept in the federal constitution. But that, that phrase doesn't occur in the federal constitution. On the other hand, they did set up a government with some overlap, not complete separation, but with separate entities. And of course, the three branches are the main ones that are talked about in the federal constitution. In my view, they intended Congress to be more powerful, certainly than it's been recently. And there are reasons that it's probably the first of the three. And they didn't put clearly, at least, judicial review. So the role of the Supreme Court has grown up over time, but it's not clear on the face of the Constitution, in the text of the Constitution. John Marshall and his court had a lot to do with that, uh, but that's been very important, of course, to the court all along. There's virtually nothing about executive power. I mean, it mentions the executive, commander-in-chief, uh, so that is a, a growth industry uh, to say there's lots of executive power in the original Constitution. It just isn't there. And I mentioned before about federalism. Uh, I think, I, I think there's reason to support what I'm about to say. Uh, that they were very concerned about rivalries among the states. Uh, the Articles of Confederation had failed. Uh, 
And so that's why they were together in Philadelphia. They were not charged with writing a new constitution. They kind of took that upon themselves. And they closed all the windows. It was very smelly and hot in Philadelphia that summer. But they came out with this full-blown constitution. And in this full-blown constitution, they gave tremendous power to the federal government. That's really the problem that they were addressing. And for all the talk about states' rights, one doesn't find it in the original Constitution uh, or actually in the post-Civil War Constitution. Clearly, in the 1860s, they were not particularly sympathetic to states' rights because they just had a civil war about that. So states' rights is important, no doubt. Federalism is important, but it isn't really in the text of the Constitution, either the first Constitution that you mentioned or the post-Civil War Constitution, which is really a second Constitution in many ways. Well, Judge Foley, you know, so the, I think the, the Bill of Rights and all of those, all of the protections that I think uh, people probably think about or think of when they first think of the Constitution wasn't added until several years later. What, what's your take on the significance of those amendments and, and sort of what do they mean to Americans in everyday life, in their everyday life, extending right to this day? You know, this is how this evolved is one of the things that historically has distinguished ourselves from other governments. And I've spent time traveling around the world. I've actually written constitutions, so I've studied them. And to have a, an independent Bill of Rights with the, the court, the Supreme Court, having the final say on what they mean and being able to declare acts of Congress or state legislatures unconstitutional was unprecedented. And, and other countries now, of course, are following that model. It used to be all the power was in the parliament, uh, and, and parliaments had the final say. So this was unique, and the delegates to the convention felt very strongly about individual rights. Many thought that uh, a Bill of Rights wasn't necessary within the Constitution, other than a few provisions like no ex post facto law, no Bill of Attainder. Um, and then they had a provision on privileges and immunities. That was about it, because they felt the federal government was of such limited power. Uh, it didn't have the power to infringe rights, or the state already had constitutions or charters and bills of rights, they would protect rights, or there were natural rights, it was understood. Uh, but it was one of the disagreements, uh, the lack of consensus, so there was sort of an understanding. Some of the states, they said, well, we'll ratify the Constitution without a bill of rights, but the first act of the new Congress is to propose amendments and 12 were proposed and, and 10 were adopted. And that's what we know as our original Bill of Rights. But as a practical matter, when we think of the Bill of Rights, we also think of the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments, which were adopted after the Civil War, the 19th Amendment, women's right to vote, you know, in 1920. Uh, but to me, as a former civil rights lawyer, as someone who's traveled in third world countries and written constitutions or been in a country where there's been civil war and a suspended constitution, um, to me, it's, it's the most valuable thing um, for the people that we have this Bill of Rights and a court that will make sure they're recognized and enforced. Well, and let's go ahead, Dean Sawyer. Well, I, I wanted to add that uh, there are some parts of the Bill of Rights which in some ways are so open-ended that they're scary to judges. Uh, the Ninth Amendment in particular uh, says the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage other rights retained by the people. So what are those rights? Well, they're not written down. So that's not contained within the four corners of the text. And therefore, the Ninth Amendment has not been used by judges. Uh, it's occasionally referred to as a kind of something you should look at, but it's not the basis of constitutional decisions. And a key question here is who are the people? And this is something I well remember from when Justice Ginsburg was last here. She did a wonderful session with high school students. Our court, fortunately, has been going out into the high schools and having real cases argued before them. And these were students who were kind of into it, but she it was a master class that she taught. And she began by saying, we the people, as the Constitution begins in the preamble. Who were the people? And wonderfully, there was a student from Radford uh, who said, well, that was slave owners and so on. And, and so they were off and running with who the people were. 
and this gets back to what Chief Justice Reckenwald said about uh, Thurgood Marshall. The people, particularly the people who had the franchise, was a very small group at the time of the Constitution. And then, in, uh, of course, that changed with the Civil War, and it changed at least uh, on the, uh, with the adoption of the uh, amendments of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments uh, post-Civil War. Can, I, I'd like to ask each of you to talk about the significance of those amendments and, and uh, the promise that they held, and then some of the reality of, of how that played out in our law in the decades that ensued. Um, um, touch fully. The 14th Amendment is just so huge um, because the way it ultimately said, you know, it, Originally, it was aimed at the federal government that must recognize equal protection of the law, um, or, or at the states and the local governments, excuse me, applied to the local governments, the states. But it didn't necessarily bring the other 10 amendments or the eight amendments to the states. But ultimately, it was construed that not only were the states required to uh, recognize equal protection of the law and due process, of its citizens, but ultimately the other Bill of Rights, uh, First Amendment, uh, Second Amendment, Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, um, and, and on. And so local and state governments are now under the Bill of Rights. And that's what civil rights litigators do when they sue the state or local government. If it's not under the state constitution, but under the federal constitution, it's the 14th Amendment, whether it's in state and federal court. Now, the 14th Amendment has, has grown. Um, obviously, initially, it was intended primarily to protect former slaves and African Americans. But it's been interpreted to uh, mean what it says, equal protection of the law for all citizens, racial minorities, women, people with disabilities, LGBTQ, um, um, immigrants, uh, people of my, minority religions and, and different types of ancestry. So the 14th Amendment is, um, is what protects our diverse nation and what holds our government in check and protects minorities. And I would put it right there with the First Amendment. It's the two most important amendments in our Constitution. Dean Seufer, share well, your that, thoughts on the significance. You said it's amounted to a new, a new a second constitution, what? Well, I think it's correct to think of the three amendments together, and it also makes sense if you want to delve into it at all to look at the statutes that were being passed uh, in that period right after the Civil War. So about a 10 year period, roughly, until Reconstruction was over in various ways, including in a disputed presidential election, where the deal was to remove the federal troops from the South in exchange uh, for a Republican president. Uh, perhaps not a good deal. But the, the amendments and the statutes were largely Congress saying, we better do something about these former slaves and their allies, and we better do it on a national scale. And they gave themselves in these constitutional amendments power to do that, to enforce this article by appropriate legislation, which had never been said before. And all of them have enforcement clauses. So Congress didn't trust the executive uh, at that point, Andrew Johnson was a pretty terrible president, and he certainly disagreed with uh, the Republicans as to what Reconstruction should look like. And they didn't much trust the Supreme Court, which had handed down Dred Scott, after all. So they really, I think, in some ways thought of themselves as, like Parliament, we're going to run this thing. Uh, and a lot of things contributed to the reason Reconstruction kind of fell apart. Uh, including lots of resistance, also a huge economic depression, as we would now call it, uh, in 1873, and a lack of will, a, a desire to return to normalcy. But if you look at the text of those amendments and the statutes, as Dan said, they are major changes. Some have called it a second revolution in constitutional law. And I think we're still getting back to it. So I'm a little less sanguine than Dan. Uh, I think there is more to be said about the protection part of equal protection, for example, um, which we've hardly ever uh, litigated, we've hardly ever talked about. There are dangers of paternalism and so on, but there's also, in the statute that was the basis for the 14th Amendment, Congress had said full and equal benefit of all laws and proceedings, full 
as well as equal. So it wasn't just about equality, it was about full rights for people who needed federal protection. Well, as the 1800s unfolded, um, you know, uh, the, the, of course, the, the, the notorious case Plessy versus Ferguson um, set the uh, intellectual basis for the doctrine of separate but equal, uh, including uh, in education. So ten, t if, could one of you sort of take us through the sweep of how we came from Plessy versus Ferguson into the 19... 50s with the Brown versus Board of Education case, probably one of the most, if not the most famous cases uh, decided by the Supreme Court, certainly in the 20th century, and the role that uh, Thurgood Marshall played in moving the law along to that uh, to that outcome. Well, it really sort of begins where, where Avi left off. You know, in the 1860s, the Congress proposed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment enacted legislation protecting uh, freed slaves and contracts and property and other areas. And then there was such a, a sort of a reversal um, politically and retrenchment and, and turning their backs on the freed slaves that the court kind of got the message. And with only one dissent, um, I think it was uh, 1896 or so, they they ruled that um, segregation uh, did not violate equal protection of the law, and they used the phrase separate but equal. Uh, Twelve years later, Thurgood Marshall was born in 1908 in, in Maryland, and um, uh, he, uh, he went to a Negro college, and then he uh, applied to University of Maryland School of Law, and fortunately, they rejected him because he was African-American, which sent him to Howard Law School. Uh, and I, I can't recall his mentor's name. I'm sure, was it Hastings or his professor at uh, Howard? Yeah. And um, that's essentially where the NAACP Legal Defense Fund movement began, uh, morphing out of the NAACP. And uh, his first lawsuit, Thurgood Marshall, uh, was against the University of Maryland School of Law on an African-American was denied admission, any one. And so they came up with a strategy of litigation to basically show, as a matter of fact, separate could never be equal. And they started uh, litigating primarily in education because they felt the right to an equal education, equal opportunity was so important for everything else, uh, exercising your rights of citizenship, employment, um, and ultimately, um, before uh, the, the U.S. Supreme Court in 1954, um, came Brown versus Board of Education. But that was an interesting story in itself because it was argued uh, a year earlier um, when Earl Warren was not on the court. And the court was greatly split on what the 14th Amendment meant and whether Plessy should be overruled. And then the uh, former governor of uh, California became the chief justice, and he had incredible political skills. And he felt to overturn Plessy in 1954 would be so dramatic that he wanted a unanimous court. He wanted a 9-0 decision. And he was able to fashion that. Um, and there was an incredible backlash against the court, primarily in the South. Um, that basically started a tax on the court that we hadn't seen since uh, Franklin Roosevelt was president in, in the 1930s or where John Marshall was president in the early 1900s. But the court weathered that, and, um, and uh, that was really the beginning of the civil rights movement in so many ways. And we wouldn't have had Martin Luther King, and we wouldn't have had the 1964 Civil Rights Act the 1965 Voting Rights Act without that litigation from the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and those decisions from the U.S. Supreme Court uh, striking down uh, statutes that segregated based on race. And, and like Justice Ginsburg, uh, Thurgood Marshall, and she's often been compared to him, and that's uh, quite flattering the comparison, it was case by case. There was a strategy, and you built uh, your your claims with a vision of where they should go. So that it was necessary, they thought, for them to start at the law school and grad school 
level because the thing that really frightened people was the notion of integrating elementary school students who could imagine what they might learn from one another. And so they started, uh, there was a separation of a law school. They segregated one and uh, the real one, as it were, at, in Texas in a case called Sweat versus Painter a few years before Brown. And the court said they're not equal. They, they are unquantifiable characteristics of a good law school. And even if you have the same number of books and even the same professors, if you don't have the alumni support and so on, these unquantifiable factors mean that they're not equal. So that was a major step along the way to Brown. But for all the talk, including in the hearings today, about textualism and about how judges should not impose their own values and so on, it would be good if there were a place you could just look it up, but there isn't. <laughs> and Brown versus Board of Education is a good example where the court was not bound by the text. And they said explicitly, we can't turn the clock back. We can't turn it back to the 1860s, the time of the 14th Amendment. We can't turn it back to the time of Plessy. And instead, what they talked about was the importance of education and the way in which stigmatization was a key part of segregation. And it was going to affect hearts and minds of students in a way perhaps never to be undone. And so it was a very forward-looking decision but not one where you could say, oh, it's really what the framers intended and therefore they had to decide this way. It was more commonsensical and it was more aware of what this thing was doing to our country and the need to respond. Uh, to, to underscore that point, uh, the 14th Amendment is mostly about states and what the states do. It doesn't talk about Congress. It doesn't talk about the federal government very much. So there were companion cases and one of them came out of Washington, D.C. So it was a federal entity. So what to do about the fact that there's no equal protection clause that applies to the federal government? And what Earl Warren did was to say, it would be unthinkable if you had a different rule for the federal entity as compared to the states. Well, it's not unthinkable, you can think of it. And so he just sort of alleged that, he insisted on that. I think, of course, he was right, but there's no equal protection language that you can make apply to the federal government unless you do this uh, one step further. So I think he, like a very wise person uh, wrote some years ago, I think Warren and his court understood that the past had a vote. You paid attention to the vote that the past had taken, to the text that they had provided, but they don't have a veto. The past doesn't decide the case. Well, you know that in the wake of Brown and then moving into uh, the 60s, there were, uh, you know, a string of decisions in, on criminal procedure where the court um, uh, increased the rights of defendants in criminal cases. Uh, and, and, and over time, you know, the, the phrase began, began to be uh, thrown around that this was an activist court, a court that was somehow uh, exceeding the bounds of what uh, judges should do or a court should do. Uh, let, let, let's sort of just Take that up. Take that up, uh, square on. What what is the role of a judge uh, in our in under our constitution, the federal constitution, and what are some of the different thoughts about how to give meaning to that role? J judge Foley, what it, start us off on that discussion. There's there's a lot of dishonesty thrown around on this issue, and some has come from our Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, not our Hawaii Supreme Court. During his confirmation hearing, John Roberts said, you know, a, a justice is an empire just calling balls and strikes. No one comes to the game to see the empire. They come to see the players. Well, there's no bigger player than John Roberts on the <laughs> U.S. Supreme Court. And uh, people use um, this concept of I'm a textualist. You know, I just apply the statute or the constitutional provision as written or I'm an originalist, I go back and, and divine the intent of these uh, founders in the uh, 18th century, what they would have done in regulating the internet or, or, or cell phones uh, or LGBT rights or you know big issues in that constitutional convention or in the, the first Congress proposing the Bill of Rights. Uh, so there's a lot of hypocrisy and dishonesty. I think most judges try to get it right they, they try to apply a constitutional provision or statute as written or as intended. But many of them, um, you know, I was just kind of reviewing one of my favorite texts, The Nature of Judicial Process by Benjamin Cardoso. And he talks about the role of common law judges. They're constantly making law. Uh, 
That's what we are, common law judges. That's our heritage. We're not from the civil system. And basically saying, you know, there's lots of gaps in any, even in statutes, the things the legislators or, or the authors of a constitutional provision didn't think of. And judges have to fill in the blanks and apply it. Um, these people don't think of everything. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples of the hypocrisy among the originalists. Uh, the greatest originalist now with the passing of Scalia is Clarence Thomas. Well, I don't think there's any question that when the 14th Amendment was proposed in the 1860s, that the Congress proposing it and the people ratifying it intended to overturn the bans on interracial marriage throughout the states. I don't think that's what they had in mind. Well, as we all know, Clarence Thomas, the originalist, um, is in an interracial marriage. And I, I don't think he would say that uh, uh, that should be able to be prohibited. Or another hypocrisy in the U.S. versus Windsor case, that was the 2013 U.S. Supreme Court case uh, invalidating part of the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, where the federal government defined marriage for federal purposes. So the originalist position should have been, well, that's not an enumerated power. That's not an implied power. Historically, the states have always defined marriage, and the federal government has accepted the definition of any state. Um, but the four conservatives were willing to uphold a statute of the federal government defining you know, marriage, which certainly wasn't originalism. So I, I think there's a little more honesty in the approach of Thurgood Marshall or William Brennan when they talk about, as Avi explained earlier, the evolving constitution, where you look at a provision, it's basic principle. What's it intend to do? Fairness or equal protection? How does it play? Is it working today in this society? Um, and obviously, our founders over 200 years ago as Avi mentioned, they were white men of property, of English descent and values that approved of slavery. Now, I, I don't know if we want to try to divine everything they wanted and apply it 200 plus years later. Um, so I, I find a lot of hypocrisy uh, on the part of many originalists. And originalists differ. I think it was uh, Anton Scalia once said, yes, I'm an originalist. Like, Clarence Thomas, but I'm not a nut. <laughs> yeah, he calls himself a faint-hearted originalist. Yeah, That's right. yeah, yeah. Uh, let me add Did one more. Yeah, to, could you try to try to set out the case for originalism? What's the what What's the point of view that uh, folks who support originalism say that they're? What, what's the principle that animates uh, that that point of view about the Constitution? And what's your own? critique and thoughts, and that what's the other point of view the, uh, that you, you've already alluded to? But if you could share with us what those two general thoughts are. Our Chief Justice is famous for asking tough questions, uh, and, that, and that's one. Uh, so the problem is there's an extreme at each end. Um, and so what the originalists say, and originalists and textualists, not interchangeable, but close, what they say is if we don't find ourselves bound by the text, then it's just what we value or what some party values that we agree with. Uh, and so we're going to impose our own values. And that's not the sort of thing that judges ought to do. And so we ought to pay attention to what the language of the statute or the language of the Constitution says. The people who oppose originalism don't say, don't pay attention to it. That's what I meant by it does have a vote. You pay attention to it. And most of what judges do is decided at that issue, at, at that level, actually. Uh, most of the time, judges are paying attention to the words of a statute or a regulation or something, and they try to sort out what it meant. But you're not bound by it uh, because it might be outmoded, because it might uh, in some ways at least be unclear. And the activist label that you mentioned is just a label, and it's used basically to say it's a decision I really don't like. Uh, and I think it's easy to show that so-called textualists and originalists often are activists. And I think the best recent example, uh, well, Citizens United is a good example, but an even better one is Shelby County. So in 2013, the Supreme Court with the conservative majority led by Chief Justice Roberts, struck down the key provision of the Voting Rights Act 
1965. And they did so even though Congress kept renewing the provision. And it was a preclearance uh, requirement that if you were changing the voting uh, operation in a state or a county, uh, you had to get the Justice Department to okay it if you had a history of discrimination in your, uh, in your governmental unit. And the court does that basically by saying, well, there was a need for it once upon a time. Indeed, there was. People died for that right to vote. But they say, we don't have that need anymore. Ergo, it's unconstitutional. This is kind of strange doctrinal notion that the court is required to keep up with the times. And they do this in the name of states' rights. And actually, Chief Justice Roberts mis misstates what the Tenth Amendment provides. So he says this is uh, the Tenth Amendment. And his paraphrase does two things that are not in the Tenth Amendment. So if you want to be a textualist, you ought to at least get the text right. And the other prop for his opinion is a crazy decision about Oklahoma becoming a state. They were desperate to become a state. They had an irrevocable contract with Congress. Both sides said it was irrevocable, not to move the state capital until a certain number of years had gone by. They become a state, they move the state capital, and the Supreme Court says, well, they're a state now, and we can't treat them differently from any other state. So it's a kind of weak basis for a decision that was very activist and, of course, has led to all sorts of vote suppression and litigation uh, ever since 2013. And if I could just add one, one um, additional level, I think originalism and textualism and the so-called living constitution in terms of interpreting constitution is different at the state level. Um, it's less controversial because let's take Hawaii, for example. Our constitution was written in 1950, revised in 1968, 1978, and we've had a number of amendments um, during that time as well. So it's more contempor contemporaneous. Uh, and it's easier to amend our, our constitution uh, if, the, uh, um, if, if the Hawaii Supreme Court uh, has a decision that uh, the legislature says isn't consistent with the intent, they'll just propose a constitutional amendment. That's what they did with same-sex marriage. It only takes a two-thirds vote from each house in one session or a majority vote in two successive sessions or a state statute. So I think um, at the state level, I think it's more so because you're not dealing with a short document that's over 200 years old, written by slaveholders, um, to, to basically try to find out what the intent was. And, and our jurisprudence is clear. What was the intent of the proposed constitutional amendment? What was the intent of the people adopting it? To look at that and to try to figure it out. So I, I think it's a, less of an issue here at the state level. Dean Seufer, uh, you, you men mentioned Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and, and uh, uh, her role and, of course, her, her uh, fondness for Hawaii and the law school, but also her role in attacking uh, uh, through a very uh, well-thought-out legal strategy uh, laws that discriminate on the basis of gender. Can you uh, share a little bit more with us about um, how she approached that as an advocate and then uh, some of her contributions as a jurist on issues related to the gender discrimination? Uh, well, as a lawyer, uh, she understood that there were some stereotypes which were very much the way most people thought and that the stereotypes were very damaging because they were not allowing, not accepting gender equality. One of the funny things that she said was she used to write about sex discrimination and the woman who was typing up her briefs said, don't say sex discrimination, that's gonna get all the guys on the court thinking the wrong way, say gender discrimination. Uh, so whether that's apocryphal or not, it's a story she would like to tell. Uh, so gender discrimination was based on stereotypes and many of us are old enough to remember all those, not all, but many of those stereotypes that had a huge impact on daily life. And so she said about, saying, but wait a minute, it hurts both males and females. And the way she focused that was to say, here's a widower who can't get benefits that a widow would get, and so on. So she built case after case, uh, and as I said, strategically and systematically as a litigator uh, for the ACLU. Uh, as a judge, she was for the most part in dissent. Uh, famously, in the case I was talking about, uh, Shelby County, she said, that's like 
taking an umbrella that has kept you dry during a rainstorm and putting it aside because you're dry. So she, she had a sort of practical approach and that I think uh, appealed to the judges. She knew what she was doing and she wasn't wild-eyed and radical in their view. On the other hand, her vision was really pretty radical. So it was step-by-step -step building towards a vision which was really to change the world, change our world. And I think she did that. And she um, obviously studied Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and took from their playbook and, and inserted gender where race had been. And the litigation I was involved in with LGBTQ rights, we took from Marshall and Ginsburg from their plays book and built on that. And one of the examples is in 1948, the uh, California Supreme Court, uh, in a decision written by then Associate Justice Roger Traynor, who some people say is the greatest justice never to sit on the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, wrote an opinion overturning California's ban on interracial marriage, 1948. And uh, it went state by state, and ultimately it wasn't until 1967, uh, a couple of decades later, it worked its way to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, where it ultimately said, um, under the 14th Amendment, you, you can't ban interracial marriage. And that's the same steps the marriage equality, LGBT marriage equality took, beginning with the Hawaii Supreme Court and the Vermont Supreme Court and the Massachusetts Supreme Court and the Iowa Supreme Court, state by state working it up in, in about the same time frame, in a couple of decades, ultimately to, uh, to present it to the U.S. Supreme Court. So Thurgood Marshall and, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg were major contributors to LGBTQ uh, equality, at least what we've achieved today in marriage equality. And it's good to remember that uh, 1967 decision, Loving versus Virginia, uh, for a number of reasons, including some that have uh, lent themselves to filmmaking. Uh, but what Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia said, there's no equality problem here. There's no equal protection problem here because we're treating both races the same. Neither can marry the other. So that's equal, it's even-handed. And of course, that's the right. court did not accept that. But at the time, there were still 16 states that banned interracial marriage. And there was also about, according to Gallup poll, about 80% of the American public in 1967 opposed interracial marriage. And it took about 20 years after that decision when people looked around and said the sky didn't fall for it ultimately to be accepted. Well, you You've both raised an interesting point, which is the relationship between the U.S. Supreme Court and, I guess, uh, public opinion. And, you know, occasionally folks will say the court's becoming too political or it's politicized. And sometimes they'll point to the number of five, four decisions or particular decisions. Is that something that um, either you of you think uh, is something that we should be concerned about, particularly uh, going forward? And... Uh, or is the court uh, is, is performing the role of a neutral interpreter of the Constitution that, that was envisioned by the founding uh, found, founders of the document? Well, you know, we've always had this, and the court's always been seen as political. Um, Thomas Jefferson saw the court as political, that it was uh, taken hostage by the Federalists, led by uh, John Marshall, and they were imposing their vision of the Constitution on the United States, a strong federal government, uh, not the, the Southern or the Republican vision uh, of state sovereignty and, and power and the right to nullify uh, federal statutes if they didn't like it. And uh, he, he put Joseph Story, uh, a Harvard law professor and uh, a Republican in Massachusetts, on the court to check uh, John Marshall. Didn't quite work out that way. He became Marshall's biggest ally and supporter. Um, but then, you know, then Roger Trainer came in from Andrew Jackson, and they moved it one way. And then you had the four horsemen, the conservatives, during the 1930s, uh, supporting business. And, and so throughout our history, the Warren Court was considered activist and political. If you were a liberal, the Rehnquist and Roberts Courts are considered activists and, and liberal. So there's sort of this ebb and flow and ultimately, it changes over time because judges retire, uh, new judges are appointed, elections matter. Um, 
courts are sensitive to the other branches of government. They may not just bend and, and do what the other branches want, but they, they don't operate in a vacuum. I mean, the switch in time that saved nine, when FDR uh, proposed to pack the court, add additional judges, all of a sudden one judge saw the Interstate Commerce Clause a lot differently and, and switched over and they started upholding New Deal legislation. Um, so it's sort of the nature of the beast. I think, you know, all judges give lip service to we're neutral arbitrators and arbiters and, 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 and Benjamin Cardozo writes in judicial process. That's the goal. But everybody's a human being and they bring their, their, their values to the court. And some are more transparent than others in, in pushing a vision of the Constitution. Um, and some are, are uh, so, let's say, more moderate in, in trying to, to be more balanced and open. But it's just sort of the nature of the beast. And, and there's always going to be a large segment of the population that is unhappy with the Supreme Court, whether it's your state Supreme Court or whether the U.S. Supreme Court. It's just the nature of the beast. I think Dan said that very well. Uh, I think judges should pay some attention to what the consequences of their decisions are likely to be, but they shouldn't be in, in any way confined by saying, oh, I've got to appeal to most of the public in this decision, because ultimately we want the judges to be there to protect minorities and to protect people who can't win in the political back and forth. And so I think that's an essential role for judges. And we talked briefly about Brown versus Board of Education. And for all that both Dan and I praised it, one can say the court made a big mistake in putting down for re-argument what the remedy ought to be. So they said, let's do that next term, next year. And in that time, the Southern resistance really got going. And it used to be said that if you drove anywhere in the country in the South, you would see gunshots and all the posters and all the billboards and so on, except for the impeach Earl Warren posters. Those were left pristine. Nobody would shoot at those. And so the court has to think about those things, and the court was thinking about those things in what we call Brown 1, but you can overthink it, too. What about the issue of court packing? That's something folks have been hearing about in the media lately. What What, what is that, and what's the... What, is, is it something that folks should be concerned about, or what are the, is it something that's driven by the Constitution, or, or is it something that uh, Congress can do? Well, the, the Constitution gave it to Congress. Congress sets the number of justices, decides what level of federal courts we have, number of federal court judges, what their jurisdiction is, all with the Congress. So it's perfectly appropriate for the Congress to uh, set different numbers. I think it's ranged from five justices to 10 justices at one time. So it's gone up and down and it just happens to have been nine. Um, the, um, I, I think the Federalist eliminated one Supreme Court uh, position right before the Republicans came in. So, so Jefferson couldn't fill it. So it's, it's not something new. Um, you know, the, the most um, famous is the failed court packing attempt by uh, Franklin Roosevelt because the court was striking down all his New Deal legislation. And the court political antenna went up and, and the, the reputation of the court changed. Um, it's certainly something that's going to be discussed because some people, it's not court packing, but they're saying the Republicans have been court stacking. Uh, by not letting Garland on and, and, and uh, rushing through uh, uh, a Barrett. And so I think this is the most serious discussion there's been since the 1930s. But Congress is certainly within its authority to do so. Um, it could also have an impact on the court, as it did in the 1930s. If the court thinks the Congress could seriously be moving to add 14 more, four more justices to move it from nine to 13, it could have the impact of having the court act more incrementally or, or with greater restraint um, and, and not have such dramatic uh, decisions. Um, but it's certainly um, constitutional and it's, it, and it's not unprecedented. I think uh, one of the things that is uh, alarming about our time, but it really is a little ahistorical, is the sense that we have reporting that stresses who appointed certain judges. 
And so it's a Republican appointed judge or a Democratic appointed judge. Didn't used to get reported that way. There was more reverence for institutions in general. But we forget that there was extreme partisanship at the time of the Federalists against the Republicans and locking people up uh, and beating them up. And yeah. similarly, throughout the antebellum period, there's a terrific recent book about how fistfights and knifings and so on were going on on the floor of Congress or just outside throughout that period. Uh, this woman who's a historian at, at Yale found a sort of witness to history uh, from New Hampshire. And he's kind of keeping, he's a clerk and so on, so he's keeping records. And he's the guy who tells you what the congressional record didn't say. And they didn't say the reason for that was they said step outside and they did. There was even a fatal duel uh, in that period. So ours is not the first moment of partisanship, extreme partisanship. Well, we're, we're almost done with our uh, time today, and I just wanted to ask each of you uh, if there are any closing thoughts to share for a minute or two, and you know wh whether you're fundamentally optimistic about the future uh, of the Constitution and any message that you would want to share with the viewers of this program about how to ensure its continued vitality. You know, we've had tragic instances in our history, uh, genocide of Native Americans, uh, slavery, the internment of Japanese Americans. Um, and so there's been many instances where our government has not worked correctly. And as Thurgood Marshall pointed out in, in the speech you cited, it took a civil war to resolve one argument. Um, but I think overall, I'm optimistic um, that there's ebbs and flows, that um, I think our system of government is actually the best in the world, it doesn't always operate that way. But as it's designed, uh, a federal system uh, where power is distributed, federal, state, and local levels, checks and balances, two different Supreme Courts, two sets of bills of rights, uh, the ideal of an independent judiciary. Um, I'm very optimistic, and I'm one who's litigated before state and federal courts as a civil rights lawyer, sat as a judge, uh, written constitutions in foreign countries, observed constitutions in foreign countries. And I think uh, I'm very optimistic that we have a great system. We just have to make it operate better. Well, Thank you. and I think we have had a very tough couple of years, uh, but we've also seen the importance of the independence of the judiciary. So that's something to be underscored. Uh, there's got to be someone who says, wait a minute, not so fast. And it really does uh, become reminiscent of what Winston Churchill said about democracy. Uh, flawed, certainly flawed, but the best that we can think of, consider the alternative. And so constitutionalism, I think, is there for the public to understand better. And I think this was a wonderful opportunity to try to uh, assist with that. Uh, but it's really upon the citizens to learn about it, not just to go by the labels. Uh, read those texts, see for yourself whether you think the precedents do or don't support. And one of the most important things I think about judges and about our constitutional system is that they have to explain themselves. Uh, unlike anyone else in Washington, for example, the judges in the Supreme Court actually say, this is why we're holding this. And then the dissenters writing for eternity, as it were, we lost the vote, but here's why we think they're wrong. And then there are separate concurrences and so on. The same goes on in state courts. And so it's a, a vivid and lively dialogue, which is a dialogue not just at the moment, but a dialogue which includes the future. Well, I think that's a very good note to end on. I want to thank both Judge Foley and Dean Seufer uh, for their insights today. I want to thank Olelo Television for giving this opportunity. And uh, most importantly, I want to thank all of our viewers for joining us uh, for what I hope you found to be a very insightful conversation today. So once again, on behalf of Judge Foley and uh, Dean Stoifer, aloha and mahalo for watching. Thank you, CJ. Thank you.